We have a really good time for you today. This is um, things that you can do at home, almost apparently. So I'm not sure if it would be approved to do at home. But here we are. Microwaves. Most of us have one of those at home. The dorm floor. And bleach is probably someplace in the laundry room. So microwaves and bleach. Um, here we go, home experiments here. Okay. And it'll be brought to you today by our own um, homegrown faculty and students. So it's a very homey sort of talk that we're having today. We feel very comfortable in that regard. Yes, and I'll feel right at home. So today we're talking about organic chemistry using microwaves and bleach. Um, Dr. Hathaway worked with a couple of students over the past whiles. Good. Maybe a year or so. How long have you been doing this? Since the summer. Since the summer? It's longer than that. Okay. But since the summer, and um, the students that have been working with him are Rory Moffitt. Let's stand up, Rory. Everybody can see you. Yes. And Karen Kubitschek. understandings of kitchen chemistry using microwaves and bleach. So let's give them a warm welcome. It's not quite that simple, but we'll, we'll try to keep it that way. <laughs> Basically what I've been trying to do for the past several years in research are three things. One is developing some drugs as potential antimicrobial agents kill bacteria and things specifically targeting an enzyme dihydrofolate reductase, which is sort of an enzyme which is critical for bacteria to reproduce. They have to make, while well, making DNA bases, and so we're trying to inhibit that enzyme in bacteria. Other thing I've done over the past 30 years or so, try to design lab experiments to help students actually learn things. You know, not just doing stuff, but learning things and understanding why they do things. And so I've done that for a long time. And then also just taking existing lab experiments and improving them and making them work better, trying to improve their safety or just how well they work. And so those are the three things that I've been involved with over the past oh, 30 or so years of being a faculty person. Uh, give you a little background. This is dihydrofolic acid, and it gets reduced, adding a pair of hydrogens to this double bond to make tetrahydrofolic acid. And this is a critical step in allowing uh, you and I and back anything that lives to make DNA bases. There's other steps that go on. Bacteria have to do this. this you know, they have to make their own tetrahydrofolate. Uh, we can get it from diet, and so you know, we wouldn't be as affected by these things being inhibited. The structures we're trying to make are these diamino benzyl pyrimidines, which Karen's going to talk a lot more about. And the ring system here looks remarkably like the ring system here. So this will just bind to the same place in the enzyme that this binds and keep the enzyme from working. At least that's the theory. Other classic compounds we work with are these dihydrodiamino triazines. They also have a similar ring system to those, and they bind in a similar way. Uh, and so basically talk about, com works to, Karen's going to talk about how she's tried to make some of these and some of the biological testing she's done to show that, yes, these actually do inhibit the growth of bacteria, which is pretty exciting. Uh, this is a lab reaction that was published some years ago. It's called a Diels-Alder reaction, where we're combining to make this really hairy, complex molecule in one step, and it's really cool. The traditional way to do that, you reflux it, boil it in toluene, which is a sort of smelly organic solvent for three hours, or you can boil it in a higher boiling, smellier solvent for 30 minutes, and you know get the reaction to go. But in a two and a half hour lab period like we have, it's, you know, it takes, that's a lot of time to do something. And so also maleic anhydride is really irritating, and so we try to avoid using that as much as possible just so, because some people are just quite sensitive to it. So what Rory did is try to use something which is similar to this and then try to, you know, speed this up in a microwave, because it's like when you cook something in a microwave, it doesn't take as long. Well, we can cook things in a microwave under certain conditions, and reactions don't take near as long. So Rory's going to be talking to you a little bit about the work he's done to improve this lab and make it work better. Uh, since I've been at Laterno, I've had a number of students work with me on the antimicrobial projects and go on and do different things. Stormy Carter started the benzyl pyrimidine work that Karen is continuing this past summer. 
A number of students also worked on the lab development projects. Krista Castle and Brianna Arnett published some of our initial work on using bleach in organic chemistry, and Karen used the results of some of that work that she's going to be sharing later. And then Josh Pickle started the microwave project and you know, made some progress, and Rory's continued that on. So basically, any of you who have some interest in organic chemistry, you know, and take organic chemistry, you know, it's really sort of fun to lead right into research projects if you're interested in these things. So that's kind of what we're up, what we've been up to. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the junior chemistry major, Karen Kubitschek, who's going to try to scare you with the title of her slide. <laughs> Okay. Hi guys. Um, thanks for coming today. I know most of you are probably here for extra credit, but uh, hopefully you'll learn something too. Um, the project that I worked on with Dr. Hathaway was uh, a synthesis of diaminobenzyl pyrimidines, and I hope that didn't scare you too bad. Uh, when Dr. Hathaway first proposed the idea to me, I was a little bit intimidated, but if we, we're going to take it step by step, and it shouldn't be uh, too bad. Hopefully you'll start to understand some of it. So over to the, uh, May of 2014, I uh, stayed in the research lab to work with Dr. Hathaway. And over that time, we ate a lot of good food, and I also turned 20. So uh, I was born in May. It's an exciting month for me. And I also, Dr. Hathaway took Rory and myself out to eat every Friday. So that was something to look forward to, uh, get out of the lab a little bit. But what we actually did was started a four-step synthesis procedure in the hope to synthesize some antimicrobial compounds. Um, so that's what we're going to go through today. This was the structure that we were looking to make originally, and the name comes from a pyrimidine is with these two nitrogen groups in this six-membered ring, and then the NH2 groups off of it are amino groups, and then it's uh, connected to a benzene group, and so it's a diamino benzyl pyrimidine, and that's what we were initially hoping to create. The first step of our synthesis was the iodination of vanillin. And we also used a variation of ethyl vanillin, which is the reaction on the bottom right here. The only difference between these two structures is this extra CH2 group right here uh, that's missing from the first structure. So this top is vanillin, and this is ethyl vanillin. And this was a fun compound to work with, because every time you open up the bottle, it, of course, it smelled like vanilla, and it always made me want a snow cone. <laughs> but we... The purpose of doing this, when bacteria is exposed to certain drugs for an extended amount of time, they develop resistance to them. And so we were just hoping that by adding an extra CH2 group on there that the, it would create a different compound and just vary it a little bit to uh, have some different effects. So what we did, we took vanillin and mixed it with sodium iodide and bleach in methanol and we're hoping to iodinate the compound. And the bleach was used as an oxidizing agent and uh, turned our sodium iodide to iodine. And that made the iodine more reactive and was able to iodinate on this position here on the ring. And so uh, we did, we did uh, synthesize those successfully. And here were uh, pic some pictures of our process. In this left picture right here is we're adding bleach dropwise to our reaction flask. And in this reaction, we have vanillin, sodium iodide, and methanol. And so the, that's actually a clear solution. But when we add the bleach, the bleach begins to react with the iodide and create iodine. And so that's the uh, color that you see there. Um, and so color is usually a good indication that a reaction is happening. So that was positive results. We knew we were going somewhere in the right direction. And uh, this was a picture. So once we finished this procedure, we got a crude solid, and you want to recrystallize your solid to purify it um, and get away any impurities or anything. And so we, a good recrystallation, recrystallation sol solvent is something you dissolve a little bit of your solid. You want the solvent to be insoluble when it's cold and then soluble when you heat it up. And so we had difficulties finding a good solvent that our crude product was insoluble in the cold solvent and soluble in the hot solvent. And so we had to use a mixed solvent recrystallization. And what we did was we put all of our solid into 2-propanol. And 2-propanol dissolved some of it in cold. So then we had to heat it all up and dissolve everything. And then add a little bit of water just until it became cloudy. And then add a little bit of 2-propanol back just until it became clear. And so it was a really tricky procedure. And um, 
a lot, I think that some of our yield was lost being still dissolved in the solvent at the end. And so we'd get three or four crops of crystals and still have products uh, recrystallizing out. But here were some of our percent yields that we got for this procedure. The top three are using vanillin, and the bottom are the ethyl vanillin. And so we got about 50% yields for these, which isn't ideal for the first step of your reaction. Uh, since we were going to be using this product in all of our subsequent reactions, you want it to be a little bit higher. Um, of course, the more products, the better for that. And so um, then once we, got our, once we got our purified solids, we were able to um, use some of our uh, lab techniques, which is NMR, IR, GCMS, and TLC. Those are uh, some of the equipment that we have in our lab that can determine purity. And so here is a picture of our NMR spectrum. Um, we run this through a sample in our. We run the sample through a machine in our lab, and you get this funny-looking picture right here. But the peaks correspond to the different hydrogens in your structure, and so based on where the peaks are located on the scale, that tells you where they're going to, what they're most likely bonded to, and where they're going to be at in our structure. So if we know the structure that we're hoping to make, then we can match up the peaks to what hydrogens and then the area under the curve, you integrate the curves and um, find out the relative amount of hydrogens. And so uh, you can set up your peak, you can correspond your peaks to the hydrogens in the structure. So that was one way that we determined purity and what compound we actually made. And then that brings us to step two of our synthesis rea uh, reaction scheme. We took our compound from step one, which is this right here, and then we heated that up with uh, potassium carbonate, DMF, and reacting it with 4-fluorobenzyl uh, chloride. And we were hoping to pull off this hydrogen and add this structure onto the end right here. And this, we were, we were able to work this reaction successfully. But first, we had some minor setbacks. We originally used ethanol as one of our solvents. And after a couple hours, we would take a little sample out and TLC it, which is one of our techniques. And that told us that we had basically a bunch of starting material left in our flask. And so we, that's a little bit of the fun of research. We changed our procedure based on some um, procedures that Stormy had done and Dr. Hathaway in the past and used DMF. And that caused our reaction to uh, work actually to uh, move towards our product. And so we did that with um, the iodinated vanillin and the iodinated ethyl vanillin. And this table over here are some of our yields. We got um, 60 to, depending on the starting compound, we got 60 to about 98% yield. And so um, that was really exciting. Um, and we were able to take, this is just a picture of our uh, apparatus set up. But we were able to take step two and bring that into step three of our reaction. Uh, so this was our starting compound. And we were reacting that with three inulinopropyl nitrile, which did not work as we planned. Uh, we were hoping to make this compound right here. But when we reacted this um, and took our reaction, then did a few extraction steps and workup procedures, we ended up getting this solid right here. So that's not a really usable solid in, um, in our synthesis procedure. You hopefully get nice, pure crystals, um, a good solid to work with, but we got this gooey, wet solid. And it was kind of disappointing after we had worked um, on the reactions for so long. And we tried different procedures and couldn't get a usable solid, but we did take this and we used NMR, and that um, <coughs> gave some promising results. We, it looked like the peaks were where we would have liked them to be for the product, and so we thought that we could maybe use this and dump that into the fourth reaction to maybe get our final diamino benzyl pyrimidine. Um, so we did that and did our fourth. So even though we didn't have a nice solid, we went on to step four and reacted what we hoped our product was with uh, guanidine hydrochloride. Uh, to make our final pyrimidine product. And that reaction, again, yielded the same gooey solid that just seemed to be starting material. And so um, it was a little upsetting, but we did um, try step four. So we knew that one, step one and two worked. We were having problems with step three, and we wanted to see how step four would do. And so we did try step four 
um, on some other starting compounds to see if we could get it to uh, work properly. So we used these two different benzyl nitriles um, and reacted them with guanidine hydrochloride under the same conditions. And we were able to get a 41% yield of this compound and a 74% yield of this one. And so we knew that step one, two, and four worked. Um, and we were able to synthesize some pyrimidines, just not the ones that we initially set out to synthesize. So um, that, ended, that ended our research over the month of May. And uh, this semester, I've been working closely with Kara to test some of the compounds that we had made and some of Dr. Hathaway's students in the past. And so we started biological testing on these compounds to see if they did have, in fact, any antimicrobial activity. So these top, this top row are the benzyl pyrimidines, and uh, 21 and 19 were the two that I synthesized. And this is Stormy Carter's compound from the previous summer. And then this bottom row are triazines that Sarah Fortier and then Dr. Hathaway made um, in the past. Uh, so we tested all of these together to see if they had any antimicrobial activity. And after a long process of figuring out the right concentration of bacteria and trying to make the plates, which I had no experience in in the past, so I was thankful that Kara was able to uh, give me some solid direction on that. But we, we made these um, auger plates and had a set concentration of bacteria inside them, so we had to make pore plates for any of you biology students. But we, then we took our drugs and diluted our drugs in a solution of DMSO and methanol. And so we cut, after we made the plates, we cut the wells and pipetted our solutions, our drug solutions, as, uh, along with two standards. And we came up, after they were incubated, we came up with our results, which we were really excited to um, see that some of our drugs actually worked. It wasn't just a disc full of bacteria. So you can see the bacteria are these little dots um, around here, and then you have zones of inhibition around the wells, and that's, um, that means your drug is working to kill or inhibit the bacteria around, around your drug. And so the top one is our standard. That's just our dilution of DMSO and methanol, and you don't want that to kill your bacteria. So as you can see, the bacteria up here shows that um, that didn't work to kill bacteria, which is what uh, we hoped. And this is a positive control. This is a known drug that we used to, uh, that can be used to kill bacteria. And so um, we tested that zone of inhibition, which is around 40, with um, the zones of inhibition for our pyrimidines, which seem to work really well for the gram-negative bacteria. Um, and then the triazine that worked the best seemed to be this SAF5, which is uh, this compound right here. And so um, some of the, di the differences would be the substituents that are uh, off of the rings. So we were really pleased with these results. And then we did it also against a gram-positive bacteria. And we got a little different results, but still um, some promise. We got uh, 19 and 5 seemed to work uh, still pretty well. And then um, we had a little bit of activity with Dr. Hathaway's. Um, so here are the corresponding zones of inhibition for those. Um, so this was a long process that was actually, it turned out to work well. So we were excited about that. Um, as far as future work in this in this project, we would like to improve the recrystallization procedure for step one. Um, when you get only about 50% yields for your step one, um, it's not too great because you're going to be using those in all your later reactions. And so if we could improve that yield and maybe find a better um, recrystallization solvent, that, that would help to um, make step one better. Also, the step three condensation reaction um, Obviously, it didn't work, and once we got the testing data from the uh, bacteria, our pyrimidines seemed to work pretty well to kill bacteria, so it would be nice if we could improve the step three reaction in order to uh, make our final pyrimidines. Um, and then also, biological testing. Uh, we'd like to continue that um, this semester to uh, get some different data and see if we are getting consistent results and uh, how we can improve that. So. Um, that was the work that I did, and with that, I'll... Oh, and I'd also like to thank um, the Welsh Foundation, uh, Laterno University, Dr. Elliot, for her um, help in the biological testing and her support, 
as well as Kara, who without her we wouldn't have had any of that data, and then uh, Dr. Hathaway for his ideas and support and direction through this whole thing. So uh, with that, then I'll let Rory talk to you about uh, what he synthesized. Awesome. Thank you, Kara. All right. So I did the Dio's Alder reaction, which Dr. Hathaway showed you at the beginning. That's when you're having like a uh, single bond or a double bond, I'm sorry, and you're having an, a, a diene come in and you're, the bonds are then, there's an electron shift that's happening in there, the electrons are shifting, and so now the, uh, the molecules combine. And so what I did was, the introduction to the process was we wanted to get something that was not only soluble in our NMR solvents, so we could run it in NMR, we wanted something that was easily purified, and of course you always want good yields. So those were the three main things we were looking for. And so the first two things we tried, which was the N-phenyl malayamide and the N3-butoxyphenyl, that's why those things didn't work. The N-phenyl malayamide, it wasn't soluble in what we first started. The, uh, this is the N-phenyl malayamide. So you got the malayamide here, and then the N-phenyl is coming off, and then this is your N-phenyl 3-butoxy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I had to count it for a second. I had to make sure it was butoxy. Um, and so that's why those things didn't work, was the N-phenyl, it, uh, it was not easily soluble in the NMR solvents, and it was also really hard to purify, because we, when we ran it through spectra, we weren't getting, <coughs> the purity of, these, of the solvent wasn't exactly <coughs> pure, and so we kind of scratched that and started to move on to N, uh, different N-substituted malayamides. And so we tried the 3-butoxy, and we got a liquid for that. Now, liquid's not totally bad, we could still use it, it was just, we had it on such a small scale that to purify that, it would be really difficult. And so we would, we'd have to either try again on a larger scale. And so again, we moved on to trying something else. Uh, this is when Joshua Pickles' research came into play. He had used uh, n 4 ethoxyphenyl and he created this, uh, this thing. And then after we tried that, I also made this n 3 nitrophenyl that's just kind of an idea to see if we could try a nitro group on there and see if something like that might work. And so that was the first thing we did was I tried, or the, I guess the third thing, was I created this 4N <coughs> ethoxyphenyl. And the main idea from this was to create a lab procedure for the students to use. And so I think we were able to do that through for the uh, 4N ethoxy. I actually created a, a type out of all the procedures you'd have to do for that. So that was, that was really exciting to get to do that. And so this is how we did that. We had the N-phenyl, or I'm sorry, we had the uh, malacan hydride there, and then we combined that with uh, p-phenetidine, and you get this malaic or maneonilic acid, which is this thing, and you see the OH with the double bond O, that makes it a carboxylic acid, which is where you're getting that from. 92% uh, yield, that's pretty good. It was a really simple reaction. Uh, scheme 2, we reacted that with uh, acetic anhydride, and sodium acetate, and from that we got about a 35% yield, so that wasn't terrible, but we didn't have a lot of it then at that point, and that's what Joshua Pickle had made. He had a lot of this on file, I guess you could say, in different tubes, so we went back into the research, uh, into the chemical room, and we just took a lot of that off of the shelf, and I started using it, and this was the really interesting part of my research. This is what took up a vast majority, and where a lot of the research came from, was Scheme 3, and so what we're doing here is you're reacting uh, the malayamide with anthracene, diglime as a solvent, and you're putting it in a microwave, and you're creating this diels alder reaction happening. And that's where you get this really <laughs> giant uh, compound. We tried naming it. It's not fun. It's not, a, it's not an easily named thing. So I just called it the diels alder product. It was not, not nice. And so we reacted it with the anthracene in a one-to-one mole ratio with diglime, and we ran the microwave at 50% power. It's a 1,000-watt microwave. And so, and we ran it for two minutes, and we got about 38% yield. And when we did the results from that to figure out the purification, we weren't getting nice results. We were discovering that we had a lot of anthracene left over. And so we were thinking about that, and so we're saying, okay, a lot of anthracene is left over, so what that means is we probably need to... Uh, not put so much in there to make all of the, or to help all of the uh, malayamid work, 
And so that's exactly what we did. We did a 1 to 0.7 mole ratio now, and we ran it at 70% power for a minute, and we took it out, we did some testing on it, and then we decided to run it at 100% power for another minute because, again, we were getting results that were showing that it wasn't pure. And so this time we got 45% pure uh, percent yield. And so then from there we did 3.2, which is I did 1, point, or 1 to 0.7 more ratio again, and I ran it at 100% power for two minutes total, and we got a 67% yield. So that looked really nice. That, that was the part where we were thinking, okay, now we can turn this into a lab procedure. So now we're thinking, well, maybe we can speed up the lab procedure. Can we put two flasks of these in the microwave at the same time for it to work? And so that's what we tried doing here, was we took two flasks. Basically what we did was we tried to, we replicated 3.2, and we did two of those vials. We put them in the microwave, 100%, 100% power for two minutes, and we got about a 75% yield for both of them. And so they're both averaged out. It was like a, I think it was like 74 and 76% yield, so... And as you can see, this is a lovely picture. What we had to do was uh, every time we made something in the lab, we had to keep a little bit of it for uh, GCMS so we could take it, uh, dissolve it, and then test it for the purity. And so you can see exactly how many things we made. All, all From like page 5, I've got things for each page all the way up to like page 31. And so you can see a bunch of different uh, chemicals we made in the lab. This is the... Uh, Malayamid that we use, the yellow stuff here, and uh, the white over here, that's the, uh, the Diels Alder product. And so the results from that was, uh, like Karen said, we have a lot of techniques to use uh, to figure out the purity, uh, like TLC, thin layer chromatography, GCMS, gas chromatography, uh, mass, spectrometry, mass spectrometry, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, IR, infrared spectroscopy. And so because we can use all four of those, it really helps us to determine if what we're getting is right because you're just doing these procedures and you're not getting like a magical check mark like, oh, you, you did this part right, like move, you can move on now. So every time we do something, we have to test it. And so with TLC, what you do is you dissolve your product and your reactants and you put them on a TLC plate and then so as you put them in a solution then, they're traveling up the TLC plate. And depending on what solvent you use, they either stop at one point or they keep going. And so if you, if you put your products and reactants on there, if they both come up all to the same point, well then you know you didn't really create anything because your products are the same as your reactants. But now if you have your products and they're up here and you have a little dot here, but you also have a dot up here, now you know that you may have a little uh, reactant left over, but you've also created some product. So that helps you know that you've done that you've at least done some of the reaction. Now NMR and IR, IR is really nice. You get to put that in a machine and it tells you what functional groups are on there. So we can determine if we have like mayonnaise acid because it'll have the double bond O and an OH coming off. And you can tell that by uh, the peaks that are in the machine and you can determine the integration values. Same thing for NMR. Those will tell you what kind of protons are on there. And so you can see if the hydrogens match up accordingly to what uh, compound you make. You're, you'll see integration values for like seven hydrogens. And you're like, oh, okay, that's a benzene ring and it's missing one. So that'll, that'll make sense then. <laughs> and then, so then, uh, GCMS, that's the thing. That kind of combines all of them together. You put it in a machine and it tells you the basic purity of it. It'll come out and say like 86% purity. And so you know that you've made 86% of this one compound and then 5% of this other compound, and then 9% of this other compound. And so it's really nice to let you know that what you've made is what you've made instead of just having this flask and not really entirely knowing what you made. So the discussion of my results, I would say for the, for the forest oxyphenyl, I think we've completed that total. There's not much that could be left to do with it. Um, the reaction we did for the N3 uh, nitrophenyl we did the same procedure for that, and we got about a 35% yield. So there's still some work that could be done for there, but for the fourth oxyphenyl, which is what we were really focusing on, that turned out really well, and I'm really happy with the results we got for that. And some problems we had to overcome were just with the microwave. Mainly, we had to figure out it was 1,000% or 1,000 watts, and from there it was just finding the right percentage at which to uh, run it at. And so along with the correct molar ratio of anthracene, to our malayamid, and so that was mainly the most problems that we ran into. And future work, 
we could probably go back to the very beginning and try with our three butoxyphenol and figure out what was happening there and then maybe do it on a large scale then to purify it because before we did it on a small scale and we were it was pretty hard to purify that very small amount of liquid so if we did it on a larger scale it would be a lot easier to purify uh, the three nitrophenol like I said we got about a 35 percent yield so we could figure out what was happening there and keep trying that at different temperatures different ratios and see if we could get a better yield from that uh, you could even do more end substituted in volumids we had done four total and so you could keep going on, do five, six. And then even for our ethoxyphenol, we have lots of it uh, still, but we could always go back and figure out what was happening in scheme two and figuring out why we were getting a 35% and compare that to Josh Pickles' results and figure out how he was getting such a uh, better result. But we were happy with the amount of melamide that we had, and so we just went on ahead and did the research there. Um, I'd like to thank the Welch Foundation, Paterno University, the chemistry department, and Dr. Hathaway for all his uh, help during the summer. We're doing it. Yeah. Well, I guess questions. questions to entertain. Questions for our speaker. Do you want to stand up? So you can entertain your questions here. Okay. All right. Questions for our speaker today? You had described zones of inhibition around all the places where you applied the different possible uh, samples that you produced, mm -hmm. and it seemed to me like some of them were overlapping so much it would be really hard to get a good exact measure of the radius of the zones. I mean, looking at a picture of these, yeah. when I saw it, I was thinking, how can you possibly get that to the to two mm -hmm. millimeters worth of accuracy? Like so this right here, it seems like you're overlapping with each other. I used uh, digital calipers when I was measuring them, and so what we did was measure from the center of the the center of our well to the nearest bacteria growth. Okay. And so um, we got that measurement, and then of course doubled it to find the zone of inhibition. Um, but we did uh, this was our first round of testing right. that we just finished on Friday, and so um, we would like to. Uh, try this again with maybe a smaller concentration of our drug um, and maybe some more plate, fewer samples on each plate to um, have more defined zones of inhibition. Um, this was our first run of it, and we did notice that, um, and so we thought that we could maybe use a smaller amount to uh, see how the, respond the corresponding zones of inhibition from that. Yeah. <coughs> Mr. Rory, you reported better results when you put two reaction solutions in your microwave than when you put in... Well, I mean, categorizing it as better results, per se, would be, I would say, a misinterpretation. I mean, we did get a 75 yield about for the... He's talking about scheme 3.3 there. And so, yeah, we got 67% for one, and then we ran it again at 75%. Now, that could just be human error, possibly, something I did in 3.3, uh, and so we're just getting different results. I, I wouldn't categorize that as increased results dramatically compared to before where we're going from 38 to 45 and then jumping from 45 to 67. Now, I would think that might be increased results, but not so much from 67 to an estimated about 75%. Well, it may have something to do with the heating mechanism here, the anthracene here, which I suspect would be eddy current heating, mm -hmm. not by your normal dielectric heating. Mm -hmm. So more may actually heat faster with respect to that sort of thing. You must check on that. Other questions for our speaker, yes, Dr. Thomas. Well, what's special about microwaves? What sort of reactions do microwaves offer a unique advantage over other ways of heating up your sample? Um, there's, a, there's a few. Thinking of off the top of my head, like Dr. Hathaway said, it speeds up the reactions because we went from a three-hour process to a two-minute process, so that's really nice. Um, you could also, there's different uh, compounds, I would think, you can put in the microwave and things that might react differently when you put them in reflux, you could also put them in the microwave, so it might be more difficult to do it in a reflux. You've got all these different... Uh, parts to it, and so you can just simply put it in the microwave, and that might speed up the pro or not speed up the process, but it would make the process easier for you. But there's actually advanced 
organic chemistry microwaves, and with those, you can put different solutions in and set it to actual distinct different uh, temperatures instead of just changing the percentage. If you want, want it to, you could make it work more like an oven then at that point, but with uh, microwave currents. And so you can set it to however many degrees Fahrenheit you want, and then you can put the things in there. And I, I'm pretty sure I've seen some where they have different boundaries in there, and so you can have different parts of the microwave running at different temperatures. So you can do many different uh, experiments at one time. Yeah, my, my uh, graduate level research was on the exchange of energy between different degrees of freedom, in particular nuclear degrees of freedom and electronic degrees of freedom. And it's obvious to me that you're pumping energy into what I would describe as being pro vibrational, rotational, vibrational degrees of freedom thermally with the microwave, and then that energy is going into changing some chemical bonds. And so not necessarily. I mean, there's, there's like three different processes of heating with microwaves. Okay. You know, the thermal, dielectric, rotational thing. Like, okay. you keep your key with these um, conjugated pi systems, I suspect, is an eddy current even when you're running the electron through the conjugated pi system, you get like a resistance type heating like you would in a wire. Okay. And so you can think selectively, perhaps, if you tune it to a particular thing, you know, it's like certain knowledge. Would, would it work knowledge. differently if you had a different frequency on your microwave? They is can. It sensitive to the they can, thing? but. Um, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, if you depending on which microwave you, you purchase, they run at different frequencies potentially. Does it no, matter? No, no, they're all the same frequency. They're all the same commercial microwave okay. all the same frequency through the water, but different yeah. outputs. Okay. Yeah. If you want to continue this exciting conversation on microwave heating, um, you can all join us at the um, corner cafe. We have the stage area. And <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm glad I did that report now in uh in research. I texted Thanks, lady. You probably have a more sophisticated microwave than I do. When I set mine on 50%, it just goes on and off half the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. As opposed to changing that. Oh, water. I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, like it would just... Huh. It just cycles. Yeah. Well, yeah, ours is a little bit smarter than that. We'll okay. it 50% power, and then it'll yeah, run for the full two minutes at 50% okay. power instead of 100, 50, 100, 50, 100. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, that would make sense. Yeah, that would be a little skewed. That would... Might not work so well. Thanks, Ben. Hey, you.